<clears throat> Hello. Welcome, friends. Welcome to the Rotary Club of Cincinnati. We are Club 17. We, this is, we are the 17th club out of 46,000 Rotary Clubs worldwide. Our motto is service above self, and we're entering our second century of service to this great city. We have a great program in store. We welcome a friend of the Rotary Club and a great champion of Cincinnati, John Barrett, Chairman, President, and CEO of Western and Southern Financial Group. You have a lot of friends here, John. We appreciate you being here. We're all looking forward to your remarks. We're going to begin our meeting with the National Anthem, led by Janet Metzelar and accompanied by Steve Haber. Oh, say can you see by the dawn's early light what so proudly we hailed at the twilight's last gleam, whose broad stripes and bright stars through the perilous fight for the Please remain standing for invocation and four-way test with Jane Burkett. It is wonderful to see everybody at Rotary today. Please pray. Dear Lord, you have given us a strong desire to do good, to be honest, to serve others. And as we celebrate spring and spiritual holidays, let us be reminded also of our faith. Our, and our obligations to our neighbors to, and to humans to do good, to be honest and ethical in all of our dealings, and to serve others. Help us as Rotarians to faithfully fulfill responsibilities in our community, nation, and the world. Thank you for our meeting speech speaker, John Barrett, who is not only a great leader and cheerleader of our city, but also was responsible as a major donor of our Miracle League Field in 1997 and our Camp Allen Improvement Project in 2022. Thank you also for the Barrett Center Cancer Center Research for everything that the Barrett family has done. Amen. And now let us do the four-way test of the things we think, say, and do as Rotarians is it the truth? Is it fair to all concerned? Will it build goodwill and better friendships? Will it be beneficial to all concerned? You may be seated. Now to welcome all our guests and prospective members, Dr. Huxmiller. Thank you, President Steve. We have a wonderful number of, of guests and prospective members. And so what I'm going to do is read their names, have them stand up for a minute or so, and then we're going to hold applause to the end. First is, is Eileen Cobbs from CB Realty, and she's a guest of Michael Schatzman. And then Angie Shepper from Parent Connect Beach Acres, and she's also a guest of Michael Schatzman. Brad McDonald, McMonagall, St. Vincent de Paul, 
a guest of Dan Long. Chuck Goodall, a retired business owner and a guest of Brad Green. David Hummel from Bank of America, a guest of Allison Kaufman. Deb Silverman, GE Aerospace, a guest of Michael Schatzman. And Dr. Carolyn Bates, who's a, who's a dentist with Equitas in Dayton. Emil El Chamas, town money saver, a guest of Michael Schatzman. And Emily Moss, who's a nutritionist, and she's a guest of Stephanie Sheard. And Jason Jones, GE Credit Union, a guest of Michael Schatzman. Kate, Kate Lind Lennart from St. Vincent de Paul, and a guest of Dan Long. Linnea Nadel, property management, a guest of Lori Leonard. Matthew Worthen, uh, dignified learning, a guest of Michael Schatzman. Michael Fitzgerald, Mortgage House of America, a loan officer, guest of Owen Rassman. Mike Klein from NRL Mortgage, a guest of Michael Schatzman. Wow. Nicole Fariello from Zeal 4.0, a uh, marketing firm, and a guest of Sarah Patterson. Patrick Ober from Stepping Stones, a guest of Chris Adams. Rosalind Phillips, my guest from Restavik uh, Freedom Foundation, working in Haiti, and Rosalind is going to, to uh, classification this afternoon. Scott Hall, <clears throat> under the weather, a guest of Kelly Mayen. Stephen Easley from Easily Blessed, a guest of Michael Schatzman. Sydney Prochaska from Mount St. Joseph University, a guest of James Williams. And Daniel Betts, uh, who is the executive director of the Cincinnati Recreation Center and a guest of Lydia Steck. And then we have several guests of our speaker, Mario San Marco, David Nevers, and Diane Plank, all from Western and Southern. So thank you so much for not applauding. Michael Schatzman, you've been busy. Woo. Welcome guests, it's so fantastic to have you here. We hope you enjoy the program. We hope you come back and join us in service. Now we have a new member introduction. Is Wes Botto here? There he is, Wes. Is Chris Kendall still here? Chris was our greeter today. Thank you for already jumping in to some of the tasks that keep this Rotary Club so friendly. Wes Botto, please introduce a new member, Chris Kendall. Thank you. Thank you, King Steve. It is my pleasure to introduce Chris Kendall. And I got to know Chris, it was about five or six years ago uh, when he first joined the club and there was a bit of a hiatus there for a couple years. But we served together on the UC Rotaract Committee. He is a UC alum, which I'll talk about here in a minute. And so he uh, helped me not to get lost every single time I came to the UC campus. I don't know if any of you non-UC alumni ever go down there, but I get lost literally every time. Um, so Chris and his spouse, Sarah, have been downtown residents now for over five years. They have four children with two residing locally, one in Minneapolis and the other in Boston. Chris grew up in Cleveland, but has now lived in Cincinnati for 44 years and is a graduate of UC. His spouse, Sarah, is originally from Connecticut. Chris is a longtime Rotarian and a former president of the Rotary Club of Fairfield, where he was a member for over 15 years. He also headed Fairfield's annual Christmas project and ran their charity auction. He was a member of our Cincinnati Club in 2018 and is now re-engaging after taking time off to manage some family health issues. Chris has a long history of service work. Most recently, he has worked to provide free tax preparation for the elderly and disadvantaged communities and volunteered at CityLink, which is an organization located in the West End devoted to alleviating poverty. 
Currently, Chris is making presentations throughout Southwest Ohio for the Senior Medical Patrol, a group that educates the public on Medicare fraud and how to prevent, detect, and report it. Chris spent the majority of his professional career with the Cincinnati Financial Corporation, where he was Vice President and Director of Commercial Property and Casualty Insurance Operations. He is currently heading the Greater Cincinnati Insurance Board, a nonprofit insurance trade organization which was founded in 1838 and the first one in America. Chris is anxious to explore volunteer opportunities with our club. He is particularly interested in local community outreach programs. In his leisure time, Chris enjoys traveling with his spouse, Sarah, hiking and playing pickleball, attending FC Cincinnati games, Cincinnati Reds, and Bengals events. Please give a warm rotary welcome to Chris Kendall. Wes, thank you. Chris, welcome. So great to have you back in the club and bringing all your talents and, and service above self. Thank you. Few announcements. This week's meeting is sponsored by Rotarian Tim Hirschner in Hirschner Properties. Tim sends his regrets. He couldn't be here today, but next time you see him, thank him for sponsoring today's meeting. Thank you, Tim. Birthdays. Please wish a happy birthday to the following members. Jane Burkhead, happy birthday, Jane. Pat Neal Miller, happy birthday, Pat. Tom Ruthman, Josh Vogel, I think you're here too, Josh. Happy birthday today. Brian Bowling, happy birthday today. And Jim Yunker, give a shout out to Jim Yunker. Happy birthday, Jim, there you are. So some family of Rotary news. We were recently informed that 2012-2013 past district governor, Peter Weigland, passed away last Friday, March 31st, at Mercy Anderson Hospital. He was a member of the Rotary Club of Batavia. We're also sad to announce the sudden passing of a good friend to all and past Cincinnati Rotarian, Al Campbell, on March 26th. Al would have been 93 in just a few weeks. Celebration of Life will be held in Cincinnati on May 12th at the Spring Grove Funeral Home. Rest in peace, Al. Please keep Rotarian Dr. Charles Pierce in your thoughts and prayers for a speedy recovery. He had a recent fall and went to UC Medical Center. He broke his wrist and punctured a lung, but he's recovering. He's recovering for at least a couple weeks at the Marjorie P. Lee Rehabilitation Center. Finally, some good news. Rotarian, pa oh, sorry, Rotarian past president and past district governor Bill Shula received a Master School Board Award in March. Presented by the Ohio School Board Association, he was the only school board member in all of Southwest Ohio to receive this award. Congratulations, Bill. There you are, congratulations. Oh, split the pot. Thank you for your spirited split, split the pot contributions. Split the pot supports membership development and makes this a very friendly place to come visit. Also makes it potentially very lucrative place to visit. There is the winning ticket, it's $81. If you, if you are a Cincinnati Rotarian and you pull the winning ticket, you can draw for the Queen of Hearts. And that revolving pot is up to $1,752. So John, I think I've sufficiently mixed this up. So. All right, the Queen of Hearts, let's see. We are looking at the last three digits are 998. Nine, nine, eight. It's a green ticket. All right, Jim. All right. Yes. 
So close, Jim, so close. The, the, uh, the plot thickens and the pot grows. Uh, all right, we have our next hand on, hands-on service project is Saturday, April 15th at 9 a.m. We will meet in coal rain to help the Red Cross pass out smoke detectors. If you can help the Red Cross on Saturday, April 15th, please contact Hux Miller. Details are on DAC DB. Our next neighborhood coffee, Michael Schatzman, is held on Tuesday, April 25th from 8 to 10 in Unataza Coffee, just across the river in Bellevue, Kentucky. Feel free to bring a guest, prospective member, RSVP on DAC DB. And don't forget to RSVP for the next professional development series, which will be held on Thursday, May 4th at 11 a.m before the Rotary meeting. Attendees will join James Lenhoff, author and coach, to learn more about a coaching model that will change your relationships forever. And now, I'd like to turn the podium over to Al Conscious to introduce our speaker. Thank you, President Steve. So these two silkworms had a race. They ended up in a tie. Oh, wait. They ended up in a tie. I'll tell you later. <laughs> so the, today we're very pleased to, uh, to welcome a longtime friend, John Barrett. Uh, the John. Uh, John's kids and my kids went to school together, and uh, now they have kids, so it's, it, it's been a long time. Uh, John is, as you know, a huge proponent of Cincinnati, serves on many boards, funds many charities, is highly active in the recruiting business. He travels with the governor on occasion to, uh, to, to recruit business into Ohio. Uh, he, as you probably know, saved the Western Southern Tournament. Uh, it wasn't called that back then, and uh, has been a longtime supporter there. He joined Western Southern in 87 as CFO, uh, named president in 89, CEO in 94, and uh, chairman of the board in 2002. Under his guidance, Western and Southern has become a Fortune 500 company uh, last year, I think they were ranked 372, and that includes some of our great companies in Cincinnati, including P&G, American Financial, Fifth Third, Kroger, and so on. John currently is spearheading a $105 million fundraising campaign to help UC's Barrett Cancer Center and other members of the Cincinnati Cancer Consortium to pursue the National Cancer Institute designation for cancer research excellence, which would be huge for Cincinnati. Uh, among other uh, things that John does to help, uh, today he's staying behind, and you've, you've heard the announcements about Cincinnati due days. We're having a little video made up that we're going to play as PSA announcements and on Fountain Square and so on and uh, John has kindly agreed to be one of the uh, future promoters of that. So please welcome John Barrett. Thank you, Al. I'm not one of Michael's guests, but uh, <laughs> there aren't too many of us here who aren't. <laughs> when I was um, uh, thinking about this talk today, I thought, could go a lot of ways, a lot of different ways. Our city's in transition, our country's in transition, and um, you know we gotta kinda come out of this thing ahead of the game. Then this morning, I was briefed on a AI uh, initiative that is going on, and I hadn't focused in on it. I just joined that uh, chat, uh, GPT, I think it is, about 20 minutes ago or an hour ago. Uh, I, d I mean, they raised 100 million members in six months. But 
what I was, you know, we all talk about disruptive, oh, it's a disruptive technology. This is really disruptive. It's scary. You talk about group think and organizing it and how two or three people can influence the world. It's all wrapped up right there. So you have the founder of uh, one of the uh, Wozniak and f four or five other very, very smart guys, including Elon Musk, have said, I think we need to slow this thing down. With that, though, you know, I was earlier in the week at a meeting with the lieutenant governor and, and uh, seven or eight CEOs from around here, and he was talking about the need for uh, more education, teach more people, turn out more graduates, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. I think he's wrong. I think we're going to have too many people here soon and that the technology is going to do an awful lot of the work. So I called him today, where he called me. We, we talked. He said, I'm not going to disagree with you. What I'm hearing is not that dissimilar. So I know we've got a college president over here, um, and all of you guys have children and grandchildren who are entering this new world. I'd try to get them as facile with technology as you possibly can because the thing is changing at breakneck speed. And many jobs and many of our companies will be no longer necessary. And many of the things that we held close to our heart can be changed with some disruptive factor putting out a tweet that says, this isn't gonna work. And they may be totally wrong, but totally biased. And you could be totally out of business. That's what's coming. So I'm thinking about Cincinnati. We're trying very hard to build our technology skills, and I think we're coming, coming along well. But I saw what Columbus did with uh, Intel. And while at first it sounds like it's a great win for Columbus, I don't know what it's going to do to their workforce, because why would you work at Nationwide at 70000 a year if you can go across, you know, half an hour away for 140 or 50? I mean, I don't know that this is going to work. So. We at Western Southern have been involved with the uh, city for you know, 135 years. Keeps evolving, keeps changing. My sense is we're at that place right now where we have to start spending our money smartly, much more smartly than we have in the past. And whether you like or dislike the skywalks, the streetcar, or a lot of the things that we've done, we better start getting a return on our investments pretty soon. We're going to be a redundant city. You can't do the nice they have. We've got to do the what we need. And I'm joined today by my colleague, Mario San Marco, who was the only guy I was allowed to recruit out of the bank in New York, not because I wasn't allowed to, but the CEO knew us both and liked us both and told me, pigs get fat, but hogs get slaughtered. <laughs> and and so um, when uh, Mr. Williams, Bill Williams, became CEO of our company, he said, John, I'd like to do something nice for the city. I'd like to do something downtown. So Mario and I got together. This is like 1988. <clears throat> got together. And we had both been in lower Manhattan for our careers. Just north of lower Manhattan was some pretty tough neighborhoods. And we had seen how entrepreneurial investment, not city funded investment, but entrepreneurial funded investment started with some bars and some restaurants, some small, very small breweries. Now you've got one of the hottest neighborhoods in the world in places that you couldn't walk 30 years ago or 40 years ago. We thought, why not here? So we picked the toughest two blocks of Cincinnati south of Liberty Street on Walnut between 12th and 14th. And we built what's called Bracket Village. But in order to do it and get to where we could start this over the Rhine Renaissance, Mario and his colleague, Tom Stapleton, worked with the developers, with the community, with, remember Buddy Gray? He went from being a very big opponent to a very good friend. We worked with all of those guys up there and Mario and Tom won them over. And we built Bracket Village, which we still own today. 
People want to buy it because it's so nice. It's over 100 units, and it's doing very well. But what's important about that is we took a chance. Nobody followed. We were up there alone for a good 10 years. In that process, Mario and his colleagues bought an awful lot of property from people who wouldn't, have, wouldn't sell to anybody else because they trusted them. And that was the key start of the Overrine Renaissance. Later, when 3CDC was formed, we um, sold all of the property we had that wasn't associated with Bracket Village to 3CDC at cost. This is stuff they never, ever could have bought. Long Vine Street, remember where Cincinnati Color was? Kaze Restaurant, all that stuff. That gave them, and we, and we decided to do that because we wanted to do our end of downtown. We could see that downtown was ossifying and that over the Rhine with 3CDC's free money could do a lot up there. And so we sold our property to them and we moved downtown. So in 2008, the um, financial crisis hit and hit with a thud. We decided let's build a new office tower that would make Cincinnati a city people would wanna to come to. We started the planning heavily and we christened Queen City Square at, on 1-11-11 at 1-11 p.m. <laughs> That's the only way we could remember. <laughs> and um, we had three major leases, took 90% of the building, the building's totally filled, and uh, it continues to do well and it's still the anchor. More of the city has moved its way. Because the way real estate works is you, um, good things beget good things. You can build a beautiful building in a cornfield, nobody will build anywhere around you. These are communities. They're not just tall, beautiful buildings. They have to, they have to make things happen around them. And that building really did. So anyway, we were like moving along through this stuff and, and we said, well, what in the world do we wanna see? What do we want our city to be? We knew we wanted a city that people would want to come back to who had left and people who would come here and stay here if they came with a P&G or a Grover or somebody. In order to do that, we had to do more. We had to get the city going in many ways. We are a very parochial town. If somebody has an idea, eight guys hate it. You ask them why, I don't know. That guy came up with it, you know? And so, <laughs> It, you know, you kind of go, really, you know? And so we decided to be different. We didn't use subsidies. We moved companies to Cincinnati without going to the state with our hand held out. Yet we're looking at our other Fortune 500 buddies getting free parking garages and all that stuff. And then we said, that's a good deal, but that's not the right deal. We're gonna do our deal. So over the last, you know, since, since the, 15 years since the Great Recession hit, we've got three of the best hotels anywhere in downtown Cincinnati. The Lytle is considered the second best autograph hotel in the world, not the country, not the state, the world, and the best hotel in the whole Indiana, Kentucky, Ohio axis. It's excellent. But right across the street, we have the Phelps, we're putting several million dollars into their kitchen right now because we believe that the takeout dinner business is gonna be a real big deal. And we think we have a very good chef uh, run it and we think that you guys on your way home at night might say, I don't feel like going to a restaurant, but I wouldn't mind having a great meal. Call that place and go in there 50 minutes later and they'll run it out to your car and it'll be great. Um, I know a lot of us do that with some of the other restaurants in town, but. We want something special, we think it's gonna work. So while we were at it, um, we made a deal with the city to upfit the park. The park is gonna be the nicest park you ever saw, including a quarter of a mile rubberized running track throughout the whole thing. And I think it'll actually be people walking as opposed to running. They're gonna to wanna to get their exercise in, but city sidewalks are kind of tough on the knees and this will be a lot better for them. And we're going to put a beautiful fountain in it and 31 new trees all to be lighted. It'll be great. People will love it. Well, next to the park, 
is a building that the previous management of our company built over 50 years ago over the interstate, first time that ever been done. It's called the 550 Apartments. We did a total gut job, and we're going to bring that back, and hopefully by Labor Day, we're going to have 26 brand new state-of-the-art apartments that people are just going to love. And guys say to me, well, who in the world's going to live in an apartment when they can buy a house? Anybody who doesn't want to mess with maintenance, taxes, neighborhood problems, and security, on and on and on. It's not going to be a tough deal, and it will be pet friendly. So as we go through this thing and work on our city, we keep coming back to some of the points that have, have gotten away, the parochialism of the city. We've got to break it. We're in competition with the rest of the world. And people say, well, what can I do? What you can do is you can encourage your friends in the Chicago's of the world to think about moving their businesses here. This is a much better environment. And earlier this week, they put the wrong person in as their mayor. So I think the exodus will accelerate. I really do. And um, they had a free choice. I mean, no one saw this one coming. But uh, that's the way people want to live. That's fine. But I know the business guys don't want to live that way. And the guy who ran the Citadel, runs the Citadel um, hedge fund, which is the world's largest and most successful, took his business to Miami from Chicago. No more Illinois taxes. By the way, he had a record year last year. This, I love this. Earlier in the week I read, he attributes to one phrase, no work from home. Everybody's in and engaged in mentoring, learning, sharing. We got through COVID. Let's keep going. Let's get back to work. It, it's tough. I know in my own case, we, we were able to get a dispensation from the governor to keep our offices open all but about probably 30 days. But it's only been in the last three or four months that I personally feel like I'm re-engaged like I was. Not from an hours of commitment standpoint, but from revolutions per minute. And too many of my colleagues and friends are not there and are never going back. And they want you and me to pay their bills. We put $5.9 trillion out over the last three years to keep people at home. Well, that baby's over. Steve Mnuchin sat in my office and said, we left Biden with 900 billion unspent money. That's all he needed. And he added 5.9 trillion to it. Why do we have inflation? Gee, I have no idea. <laughs> uh, I was with Governor Sununu earlier in the week, and he's, he's, he's running for the high office, good guy. But I said to him, uh, how do you feel about running against Biden? He said, it's really interesting, John. F 42 governors were visiting with him at the White House, and he started to answer a substant substantive question and get into it, and his staff stopped him, said, you write to us and we'll give you the answer. This meeting's over. What? The President of the United States taking orders from a 32-year-old? What the hell's going on here? We got to change this logic and this thinking. In our city, we should control our own destiny. It's no good if you have three or four councilmen going to jail, right? That's not right. We, as part of CBC, were part of that problem. We went to the strong mayor concept. We thought we knew better. We didn't. Murray Season Good had it right. He really did. We need to think about our governance. If you want people to move here, you have to have a clean city. When people in the legal department do the due diligence, when we talk to a CEO, they come back and say, corrupt politicians. It's kind of hard to say, no, nah, they're not. They're really good guys. Honest to God, you know? It's like the two guys at the Illinois State Prison were talking. And one guy said to the other, God, the food stinks. And the other one said, you're right. It's much better when you were governor, you know? <laughs> <clears throat> well, long story short, a lot of stuff we got to do. We got to rework our political structure. Healthcare. New York City has four major healthcare systems 
Greater Cincinnati has seven. What do you think the administrative costs are there? 40, 40%? Crazy, nuts. Again, parochial, the banks, um, how do you think we're doing there? I don't know, do any of you guys live there? I don't think so. Could have done that better. Fountain Square, I think we really messed up, but the good news is Fifth Third's putting some serious money in it and bringing it back. Retail strategy, we need a new one. When we took the skywalks down, it took the, the people like in my office out of the shopping downtown because it was safe, convenient, and fun. They quit shopping downtown seven or eight years ago. We need to refocus on the river. If you look from a building down the river, there's nothing, there are no restaurants anymore in the river. There's no action on the river. We gotta get that back. And part of that has to be, we gotta light all the bridges, every one of them, really nice lighting. Newport on the levee will open in a year or so, and it'll be, it'll be very active. And we have the old LNN bridge, or the uh, Purple People Bridge now, to link the two. We gotta get people using our stuff. And I think they will. I don't think the divide between Cincinnati and Kentucky is anything like people say it is. I'd love to see us connect more closely with Newport and Covington. We're recruiting um, one of the coaches, helping to recruit one of the coaches to town. <clears throat> and I, had, I met him in the Lytle for, for a beer. And we were talking. And I said, well, where have you been? Well, they took me over the Rhine and the banks and all that stuff. I said, let's go in the car. We rode around old Newport and old Covington. He was sold. He said, this is a, this is a city with history. This is cool. And he's a wonderful guy and we hope to keep him, but you know, in the life of coaching, maybe you'll be here, maybe you won't, but, but at least he'll leave and say good things if he doesn't stay. So we, I was part of the group that raised the money to cover, uh, put the, the footers in for the covering of Fort Washington. We gotta do that. That's three city blocks, they're each like 400 feet. Why? The banks are separated from the city. We can't have that, we gotta bring them together. I don't know what you put on, it will only support three or four stories of buildings. But the important thing there is that we do it and move on. We spend our money on stuff that just doesn't enhance our city. I think by covering the banks and thinking creatively about what we would do on top, it would be, it would be a big deal. We need to develop the area between Liberty and Calhoun. It's a gold mine if we do it right. Safety is obviously paramount importance, but the convenience of it is crucial. There's so much there. And it's, it's starting to happen, but it's, it's too slow. It's too convenient to not work. We gotta get that done. And we need a lot more quality housing downtown. I think people like living downtown, but they need more choices. They really do. Misses, I think the strong mayor movement 10 years ago was a miss. Skywalks, streetcar, the Fountain Square, a retail strategy. All of those can be reworked and should be, and you guys will do it. So this year is our 135th year in doing, of being in business. And Mary Beth Ray, whom many of you know, said, why don't we go to the UC Economic Center and see if the stuff that you and your guys are doing all of our senior managers are on boards, many more than one, and many of our vice presidents are also. And we're giving freely of our time to necessary things. <clears throat> so she commissioned the study, and the UC Center for Economics did the study, and they came back, and they said, since 2008, the efforts of your team have generated $27 billion of economic activity. That's a lot. Imagine if everybody was doing that. I mean, we run five or six major charitable events a year, but if every company ran at least one, just one, think of what we would get going, the activity and the quality of life in our city, which is pretty darn good as it is, this would be better. 
So you ask, what can you do? Talk our city up with your friends and colleagues in other cities and encourage them to look here as a possible place to move. Now, I was asked to take questions, so rather than go through a speech, I'd, I'd, I'd rather open the microphone up. If it's really complicated, either David Nevers or Mario or Diane can handle it, because <laughs> I just work here. <laughs> <clears throat> so with that, thank you for the opportunity to be here, and I hope, I hope we leave today with the idea of what can I personally do to make this place better. If more of our folks did it, there'd be no touch in us, really. And as I say, the disruption going on in the rest of the world is really hurtful. And your largest cities are gonna be the most hurt. It's a new world. So, any thoughts or questions or comments? Do we have time? We do. Okay. <clears throat> <laughs> my my favorite media mogul. <laughs> well, we're trying. Uh, thanks, Doug. What we're going to try to do? We've we've signed an agreement. the The question was, what what's the vision for our end of downtown? We entered into an agreement to acquire, option to acquire the Masonic Temple. It's a 350,000 foot gem that's very hard to use. So we're studying putting a, wrapping a garage around it and a brand new hotel on top of it, but using the Masonic Temple as the uh, party rooms, meeting rooms and everything for the hotel. There are seven major different rooms there uh, of all sizes. I mean, they hold anywhere from, I guess, 900 to 200, 300, I don't know. And I, w I went up to Chicago six or eight months ago to see a, a place up there called, the, I think it's called the Metropolitan Club. It's not downtown. And it's the same kind of building, and they have 55 hotel rooms on top, but the life in that place blew me away. You were never more than 50 yards from a barista. Uh, there were families there. There were people working out. Rooms this size. The Masonic Temple has, I'd say, four rooms this size and three bigger, plus a 320-person church. Um, all that stuff is in there. But rooms like this would have, at, at the place in Chicago, 100 fitness machines. And there'd be 35, 40 people working out. I guess they were working from home because it was in the afternoon, it wasn't at night. <laughs> <laughs> but there were mothers there with their kids. The whole thing was just, you can do it. The question is, do we have the scale to do it here? Do we have the people who would use it here? My sense is, yeah. There is, and, and so that will be another thing we're working on, Doug. If we got that done properly, um, and, and if it worked, it would be a game changer for our city, it really would. You know, we're struggling with the convention center. They wanna, the um, question is, do you build a new one or just renovate what we have? The, the question that we have at our shop is, what's the future of conventions? probably always will be places like Las Vegas that are gonna have big conventions because of the things that are outside the convention. But are people still gonna to go to those when so much can be done from your computer and your office or your home? I just don't know. So why spend half a billion dollars and be wrong? Heritage Bank Arena, yeah, I, I kinda of think that's well past its time. Built on the cheap operated to make money, but not to attract people. That'd be probably a smart move to redo that one or rebuild it. Yes, sir. Oh boy.
Thank you. That needs to be studied, and <clears throat> we shouldn't build a convention center until we know, right? But I do think additional housing encourages additional spending and additional activity. You know, so I think, you know, good apartments, maybe condominiums would be helpful. There are plenty of, um, plenty of opportunities here to take the C buildings and make them better. Unfortunately, many of the boutique hotels that have been put in, I, I don't know, I ask myself why. What is gonna, who's gonna encourage that person to go there? I noticed that a couple of the restaurants in those places have closed already, and not, they're not very old. There just isn't that traffic. There are 10,000 restaurant seats downtown right now. That's too many, too many. So our feeling is the hotel business is turned into the entertainment business. You've got to have stuff going on in your hotel to attract people. And we make an awful lot of money in our hotels by local people doing staycations. They want a two or three day break. And they come in, use the city. I mean, it's hard to do something like that in Blue Ash. I mean, we're gonna go, right? <laughs> So downtown's a lot easier. In the last week, though, I've met with two very big companies about relocating to downtown Cincinnati. <clears throat> One, I feel very good about be out a year, two years. The other's listening. But if you're in a city like Chicago and you come here and you first of all find out that your, your commute's 20 minutes, and it's not bumper to bumper the whole way in and the whole way home. And, and it's, it's nice and the, and the neighborhoods are nice and our housing stock is so inexpensive versus the big cities. Unbelievable. So we're a pretty good deal. Yes, sir. Who is that crackpot? We know who wrote it. Thank you, Bob. That's gospel. <laughs> yeah. Well, I think a, a movable bus makes so much more sense. It can go where you want to go when you want to go there. They don't have to be 200 seaters. They can be smaller. The, the cost of that is really the cost of the driver and the depreciation of the bus rather than a whole line. Um, and you know, our streetcar is free now and still empty. 
It's too slow. They ran it through in a hurry. I think if Mario and his crowd had studied it and done it for him, the streetcar would have been a couple blocks east and a couple blocks west. So it would have, the middle of the city would not have had the streetcar in it, it would have been around it to encourage the development around it, but also to allow for faster communication, faster movement. You know, Vine Street's not exactly the best place to run a streetcar, but you know, they did it. They had an opportunity uh, probably four years ago to get out of it, get out of the money and all that stuff, and they opted not to. And then they had a, a, a run of trying to get people to use it. Now we're free, free to the rider, not to the taxpayer. And so, you know, we just, we just have such bonehead um, <laughs> thinking. And, and part of the problem with that's been the decline of the newspapers. There's nobody questioning this stuff. Nobody writing in-depth stuff. Everything's a soundbite. Um, you know, there, when you knew you'd be held accountable, you tried to do a better job. We just want to, you know, hey, did you see this? Did you see my tweet? I'm out there. And you go, well, you're out there all right, like an idiot. But, but you know, people are different, and they want to be, they want to be out there. So, I saw some, yes. Thanks for everything you did for the city. And I couldn't say more than what Bob just read. What are your views on the potential sale of the Cincinnati Southern Railway? I, I think that the, the sale of the railway would be really good for us. The spending of the proceeds have to be figured out. Politicians will run through it. So there is, there is a committee that's been put together to try to help with this. But there's political issues with this, you know, and you know, some people say that some of the Columbus politicians don't feel we deserve it, and that's the craziest thing I've heard. But if we got the money, we ought to probably figure out, if it's a billion six, say, tax-free, right? We ought to probably take a number and say that's gonna be paid out to the city in annuity form for a long, long time. Don't let them get to the principal. Because politicians will spend it. I don't care who they are, what party. They'll burn a hole in their pocket. You know, the reason the banks got developed so much was because a couple of big mouths started screaming that we have to do something with that mud pit. And look what we got. We could have planned it out. It was like 2006 and seven, and um, we got what we got because we didn't. It could have been a much better spent, money could have been spent much better. Now, no, don't get me wrong, we're part of it too. We, we have a hotel down there that's very, very successful. Um, but it's, it, everything could have been better. Other thoughts, comments, questions? Does everybody know Jane's getting married? Oh my <laughs> Two months. <laughs> oh, I'm supposed to tell him in two months. <laughs> True story. <laughs> yes. Every city does it right. Now you say, well, how would we ever afford that? Well, I've got an idea. Okay, what about lighting the bridges? I know this is gonna cost. <clears throat> I'll say, I've heard there was an idea out there, so don't quote me. When Duke Energy merged with Synergy, Synergy had, I think, a $105 million foundation that went to North Carolina. I don't think you see a fraction of the donations coming back that we used to have from Synergy. My suggestion would be we go to Duke and the CEO is a Cincinnatian and say, how about it? Get full credit and help us light the bridges. And you know, it's right up their alley. So to be, to be uh, tackled yet, right? I think it could work. 
but we ought to. And we ought to have restaurants on the river, all that stuff. We need it and be fun. The city's got to be fun. Yes. But there's a cost to putting the lights on. You're hired. <laughs> yeah. No, technology is changing everything. It is. So my message to my colleagues, now we have, what, 2,000 home office employees. We have another... 800 people around the country who are working in office jobs for us. We have 1,000 W-2 uh, agents and 97,000 1099 guys. So my message to our crowd this morning was, whatever we do, let's not become irrelevant. Let's make sure there's a place for us. So these disruptive technologies are gonna change the world. Let's not become obsolete. And, and we got to, and we, and we don't want this, we don't want society to be obsolete. But I think if we continue to think, have groups like this, you know, groups like this with AI aren't gonna be, this is not what they want. AI wants to control you. They don't want you getting together and talking without being censored. It's not right. You gotta watch for that. But that's a good idea on the technology for the bridges, but we gotta get to it. And um, they keep punning, they say, it's a Kentucky problem. No, it's our problem. Anyway, Stephen King or King Stephen's trying to get the hell out of here. <laughs> Thank you, John. Hey, that was great. John Barrett, chat GPT can't replace you, that's for sure. They might be able to replace me, but my goodness, that was fantastic. Thank you so much. And just like we have echoed, we appreciate so much your leadership for the city i wrote down so many things on this paper but promoting business beautifying the city promoting good governance promoting charity in our city i especially enjoyed the comments about what we can each do to make the city a better place on all of those fronts in um as a token of our appreciation for your presentation here today. We wanted to give you a Rotary Club of Cincinnati coin. And on the back of it is that four-way test that we recited in the beginning. We think it's one of the ways that we make the city a better place and contribute to this great city. We also wanted to make a donation in your name to the End Polio Now campaign. That's the, the four-decade effort to eliminate wild polio from the planet. So far in 2023, there's one confirmed case in Pakistan. So we're not gonna give up until it's gone and it's gone for several years, but with your help and a little effort from Rotary and the Gates Foundation, we're gonna see it eradicated. Um, also, extra thank you, John, for promoting Rotary Due Days. It's another way that we're trying to give back to the city. Let's give John Barrett another round of applause. Look at that. Just a couple final announcements. We have two meetings. Classification meeting in the Julep Room. Environmental Sustainability is meeting in this room. Next week, we are not at the Hilton. It's a road show at the Metropolitan Club in Covington. The Met Club is generously covering all the AV setup and validating parking in the garage. Word, one other word about that, the RSVP window is going to be a little shorter. The Met Club needs to hear what your order is by 10 a.m. on Monday, not 5 p.m. So get those orders in early. We'll see you there next week. We have an exciting program with Channel 12, Liz Bonus, Mark Murphy, Butler County Sheriff Richard Jones, and Ohio Rep Cindy Abrams are participating in a discussion called Fentanyl at the Border. 
be there. Until then, have a great Easter and a great week. Meeting adjourned.